Welcome to The Get Together. Together. This is a show about the nuts and bolts of community building. I'm your host, Bailey Richardson, a community researcher. 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 I'm, I'm Kevin Wynn. I'm also a researcher, uh, her sidekick, business partner, all that good stuff. Each episode, we are going to interview people who have built communities about just how they did it. How did they get the first people to show up? How did they grow to thousands more members? Today, we were super excited to talk to Sarah Pollock, who started as YouTube's film community manager back in 2007. At the time, YouTube had just been acquired by Google, and Mia Qualiarello, YouTube's first community manager and a friend of mine, hired Sarah to help expand the film industry's understanding of what YouTube was and what it was capable of. Today, we're going to talk to Sarah about one specific project she worked on to do just that, a film called Life in a Day. Now, this film is like no other film I've ever seen. It documents one day, July 24th, 2010, from the perspective of YouTubers around the world. There was just something that was so beautiful about the human condition and what ties us all together and makes us similar regardless of where we live and what we have. So yeah, it was just really special. In total, more than 80,000 clips were submitted by YouTube users of their experience of that one single day. I remember when I saw it for the first time and it stuck with me ever since. Kev, you've seen Life in a Day too. Uh, Tell me, why were you so excited to talk to Sarah today? I really enjoyed talking to Sarah. From a community building perspective, celebrating together is just one of the best parts. You know, I've been part of some summits and other like big community celebrations and there's nothing quite like it. So, I mean, you're celebrating throughout, you're acknowledging people, but like a big celebration really is an opportunity to move a community forward. You know, it removes people's motivations. I've left summits and thought like, oh my gosh, this is why I exist, you know? And I, But with YouTube, um, I think Life in a Day really looked at, hey, we have a community of creators. A celebration like Life in a Day and making a film makes so much sense um, to bring all of these creators and YouTube, you know, the headquarters knows that we're able to see everything that's happening everywhere. If we bring this together, and really galvanize the community, maybe we can create something extremely special. Um, And from seeing it, I I believe they did. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it's really hard to see something that feels like a really emotional celebration that's not people getting together face-to-face in person. And to me, I think this actually really makes people feel that way, but it's digital. Mm -hmm, And, mm -hmm. And that was really, to me, that's what makes it such a special example of a community celebration. Yeah. What were you doing on July 24th, 2010? listeners. I don't remember. No, I, don't, I don't remember either. <laughs> I was probably in San Francisco in the oh, fog. Oh, I had just had gone through a breakup. <laughs> oh my God. Watch YouTube, I was, Kevin, I was, win that I was talk. crying watching YouTube's life in a day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. We're going to talk to Sarah as she drives to the polls to vote. So tune in and we hope you enjoy the conversation as much as we did. First, I've seen that you worked in more traditional film. I saw you were close to Little Miss Sunshine, which like rad, Mm -hmm. love that movie. Um, But you you ended up at YouTube in like 2007, if I'm getting my dates right. How did that happen? How did you go? How did you meet Mia? How did you end up working at a tech company related to film? How'd you make that decision? So I had been working in New York in in the film land for about five years. I had been at a few different companies, uh, mostly as an executive assistant, first at a place called Green Street. That was a small production company that Fisher Stevens and John Snotty had then at Miramax. And then at this company called Big Beach, which is where I got to work on Little Miss Sunshine and everything is illuminated and a bunch of really great films. But I think after five years, I was a little bit disillusioned with that industry. It felt really like impenetrable to me in some ways, even though I was in it. So I was having like a little bit of a crisis of what do I want to do? And I was thinking about all kinds of jobs. Honestly, I had a, I went to get a career counselor and I was completely all across the board. I almost went to law school. One day I heard that Google was buying YouTube and Um, You know, to be totally honest, I remember telling Mia this in my first interview, like I wasn't a huge YouTube user in 2006, 2007. I really didn't know that much about it, but I could imagine that it was sort of going to be the future of entertainment and that it was 
probably going to grow really quickly and that if I, you know, went over there, I could probably use my background in film and entertainment, but potentially in a more kind of innovative, cutting edge industry that was going to move a lot faster than the traditional film business. So I remember I sent my resume in online and then found a family friend who worked at Google who forwarded my resume specifically to HR, something like that. Anyhow, I miraculously got a call, which I remember taking, there was a Virgin store in Union Square, and I remember like flipping out. I remember that. I remember that store. remember that? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So that's that's where I had my introductory call. Hmm. And I remember I, I, to to be totally honest, I like made up some uh, competitive opportunity that was going to, I mean, I didn't make it up, it existed, but it was like moving really slow and I made it seem like it was moving really fast and like I was going to have to, you know, we were going to have to sort this out quick. That and sounds very movie business it, of you. Good for you. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> I, I, I dug deep there. I dug deep. Um, <laughs> Skill yeah, transfer. And I flew out to San Francisco, lay on as the film businesses. I made absolutely no money and lived in New York City. And I remember getting Alone, I mean, you know, just like having a flight to San Francisco uh, was like mind boggling to me. And then I got to San Francisco. I didn't have, nobody had talked to me about a hotel and I was too like shy. And would they really put me up for a night if I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't know, this was so mind boggling to me. So I remember landing and being like, okay, I don't know where I'm going to go after this interview and calling some family friends to see if I could stay with them. And then at some point HR being like, oh, and you know, you have a hotel room at lift or something. I was like, wow, heck is something else. Um, <laughs> anyway, in any event, I had like a five hour interview. Mia was one of the people that I met and I, I just loved them. I really loved them. YouTube was like 80 people at that point in time. So it was a very different vibe, probably similar to your early days at Instagram. And yeah. uh, it, it worked out. It all, I can't, you know, I think it was fairly quick after that. One of the things that, you know, Mia was like, I think the first community manager. So she's, I feel like trying to find really special people to grow her team. And she told me, I think in the email that she sent me connecting you and I, that you were the best hire that she ever made. Why do you think Mia picked you? What do you think it was about your skills or, you know, your way of approaching the work or approaching film that made her, her pick you? Uh, well, first of all, I can't believe that is true, but she is the nicest, kindest person ever, and I love her. Um, I think timing had a lot to do with it. So I, my first job at YouTube was being the film community manager. So I was specifically tasked with building a filmmaker community on the platform, trying to get filmmakers to think of YouTube as a place for them and their content, not just amateur home video, et cetera. So I think you know the fact that I had some experience working in the film business, working with talent, agents, et cetera, and being at film festivals helped. And I have to imagine that I was probably one of the first people to like proactively push to get in there from the film business at that time, which was just the luck of me kind of being a bit disillusioned and looking for something at the right moment. I think though that the team Mia built at the outset was incredibly special. There's a few people left now dispersed through Google, not at YouTube. I think I'm the only one at YouTube now. But I think it was a group that we reflected Mia's values, wanted to highlight great storytelling and had authenticity and a belief in what YouTube could be and do at the highest level that was really optimistic and positive. So yeah, I think that probably was a shared attribute among all of us. Yeah, that sounds very familiar to my experience with Josh, who was the first community manager at Instagram. I really feel like he set a humble, generous, egalitarian kind of tone about what we were trying Mm -hmm. to do. And it was really a beautiful way of approaching the work. And I think all of us really mimicked his, his approach. And that trickles outward to everyone you communicate with you know, connect with and the work you choose to do, obviously. But how did you come up with the Life in a Day project? Was it an extension of this strategy of getting the film industry or people to feel like YouTube was a serious place for film? How did this project merge? So I get zero credit for the idea. It was all a guy named Tim Partridge, who was based in our London office at the time. He pitched this idea. There was this program at Google or YouTube, both actually called the Dragon's Den where marketers could pitch creative out-of-the-box ideas. 
um, I think annually, and a group of senior marketing leaders would kind of hear the pitches, ask questions, and then a handful of projects would be chosen at various levels to be sort of resourced and brought to life. And so Tim pitched Life in a Day, and I, I can't recall exactly if it won the entire thing or it was like one of the runners up, but in any event, it, it was up there. And I remember actually having a meeting with Tim because of obviously of my role and my background where he kind of explained it to me. And the first time I heard it, I was like, Tim, like, I don't know, man, I don't, I, I don't like a documentary made from hundreds, if not thousands of points of view, like, how is there going to be continuity? Like, how will it feel to go from one clip that could potentially be super high quality to something really low quality? And, you know, how are we going to weave this narrative? And so I had like a lot of questions and a dose of skepticism about whether it would work. So I shared that feedback with him and kind of said, you know, here are some things that I would think about as you try to flesh this out. And maybe a few months later, my boss at the time came back to me and said, you know, we want you to oversee this project. What do you think? And I was like, well, uh, that's, you know, ironic because I had given Jim some feedback, but of course I would be happy to, and I really want to figure this thing out and figure out how it works. So Tim ended up joining my team. I think that was then that he moved to San Francisco. We had a small but mighty kind of SWAT team across. You know, at that point, we were considered marketing because there had kind of been an evolution from the editorial slash community management team to marketing. And so we had sort of a SWAT team across marketing and PR start to work on it. I think the reason people were excited about it was twofold. I think one, to your point, you know, we were able to work with Kevin McDonald and Ridley Scott and I think send a message about the caliber of work happening on our platform and the partnerships that we were striking but I think also, obviously, and this is true of Symphony Orchestra too, like there was this really amazing period in YouTube's history where we were so focused on just how do we demonstrate the ways in which technology can be both innovative and net positive and drive new ways of storytelling and building community. And this was certainly, I think, you know, a great example of that brought to life. Can you tell me about what the original idea was? Because all I know is the final, you know, life in a day, people submitting their life on July 24th, uh, one day. Mm -hmm. And what, what year was it in 2010? Uh, 2010. Yeah. And what was that very close back. to the original idea or what, what ways? Did it you really was. It? it really was. I mean, to be honest, that was sort of the original pitch was like 24 hours on earth what was it called? it was called world in a day at first mm -hmm. that was the pitch 24 hours glimpse of life uploaded by people around the world in different languages countries etc and I think it was with Kevin McDonald that we kind of refined the ask because obviously it's a challenge to weave a story that's comprehensible across so many different people's experiences and content so Kevin ended up I think adding the specific questions that we asked people like what do you love what do you fear I think there was one kind of tangential one about what's in your pocket right now but trying to just get a little bit of shape I guess around some of the stories that would come in and of course some things that came in like really didn't directly answer those questions which was fine and great but some did and I think that helped give some structure to what you ultimately saw and I, love, I love the Go what's ahead. in your pocket question I mm -hmm. was just mm -hmm. You know, seeing, you know, someone's just, I have nothing. And then there's like, you know, a little kid is like, I got this many souls. And then other people like right. pulling out guns from their handbag. <laughs> and it's just something so, yeah, good. It was, uh, you know, what came out of that question. It, totally. And I remember like we talked about that one a lot. And, you know, really part of his intention was just to like make people comfortable and to like ask something that was relatively, I think, straightforward to answer to like ease people into it. But it's true that obviously there's a lot metaphorically that comes out of, that question. And how come you guys decided to work with Kevin McDonald? I'm not a huge film buff, so I don't know a ton about all the different directors out in the world, but what was it about him that made him the right fit for this kind of work? Yeah, you know, to be honest with you, he was actually attached to the project already at the time that I came on. And I think if I recall, it was first we partnered up with Ridley Scott's production company, Scott Free. And I think that's because um, one of our marketing execs in London had a close relationship with the company and Ridley and Liza. And, um, I believe they brought Kevin on and um, 
you know, I think just the fact that he was, you know, an accomplished documentary filmmaker who was genuinely interested in this idea and excited about it, which is kind of rare at that point in time. You know, I think there was still a fair bit of skepticism within Hollywood about YouTube. And I think to have somebody who was accomplished, you know, so talented, but also just like really interested in it and what it could be was pretty amazing. So that's how it came to be. And you, one of the things you said in the beginning is that you were concerned about it having continuity. Obviously, you yeah. guys ask questions, but you talked about even video quality and trying to make sure that it comes together. How did you accomplish that with videos from so many different devices and so many different places? How did you create continuity yeah. from that? Well, to be honest, I mean, so the creative of the film was really, really driven by Kevin and Scott Free. And so that happened in London. They had an edit room that had tons of editors working. And I remember, I think, a lot of like young film students in London who they recruited into the project who went through, I mean, like, I think just the process of documenting, auditing, all of the content that came through was tremendous. So there was like this period of crazy categorization, which ranged from video quality and resolution to like themes, the richness of the characters who appear, like really, really intense documentation period. And that filtered out some content and identified stories that would come back throughout the film. And, you know, then it was really Kevin and the team at Scott Free that pieced together the story and made it what it is. And I remember, I mean, we went, I remember going to London and seeing a rough cut by the time we saw it, it was already like amazing to me. I was just completely like goosebumpy, blown away that, you know, it really had worked. What about it made you feel, take me into that moment, like what about it made you feel goosebumpy? In part, it was just the like miraculousness of, wow, this actually is a compelling story that was told by so many different people but I think there was just you know and I need to I want to like go back and watch it again it's been years since I've seen it actually um but I think there was just something that was so kind of beautiful about the human condition and about people and like god if you really think about it in the context of today it's like oh I would I would love to just immerse myself in the feelings that I had watching that and just kind of somewhat spiritually feeling really great about humanity and people and what ties us all together and makes us similar regardless of where we live and what we have. So yeah, it was just really special. And I guess that's part of too. I mean, I, I guess at Instagram, we thought a lot about if not, but for Instagram, you can't tell these kinds of stories and Mm -hmm if not but for YouTube, you can't have that kind of visibility around the world into so many different types of lives. The project to me of, you know, users creating content, submitting it, and the film coming from such a broad egalitarian base of regular people feels so Mm -hmm. closely tied to what makes YouTube special. But could you say it maybe from your own perspective of someone closer to YouTube and closer to the process, why you thought that this project and the film was such a good fit for exactly what YouTube was and what the community loved about it? Yeah, I mean, I think you just articulated it very well. <laughs> um, but I do, I mean, I think like it's, it's really, it was the best example, I think, of what YouTube could do and be in terms of people just genuinely and authentically wanting to participate in this quote unquote experiment. That's what we called it, an experiment. The project and or YouTube as a site was an experiment? The project. Okay. The project. <laughs> yes. Um, which was important to us because, you know, I mean, I guess that even shows from the get go, we weren't totally sure if it would work creatively. So we actually referred to it in messaging externally mm-hmm. as an experiment and, you know, invited people to participate. But yes, I think it's, you know, one of the most beautiful expressions of YouTube. And I think, you know, for a site that it, it is very, obviously, YouTube is still very community driven, but it's also very creator driven, right? And like, we all kind of aggregate around specific creators and there's a dialogue there's a back and forth there's a sharing but we're the fans and like we support the creators and I think 
this was sort of a, a slightly different time, or at least a different experience of YouTube where it was very egalitarian and it was like everybody contributed and took part in an equal way. That was special. Absolutely. And how many people contributed or how many hours of video? Like how did, how many people raised their hand? Do you know? Yeah, I need to, I need to, I did know it was a, it was a stat I held on to for a long time, but um, I want to say it was 80,000 hours of video, but I will, I'm happy to double check my, my notes on that. And I think it was, you know, over a hundred countries represented, but I'll go back and look. Yeah. And how did you get, you were just talking about the messaging and how you described it as an experiment, but how did you get the word out to people to submit? Did you do it through the product, through partnerships? Like how did you get awareness out that people could participate in this project? So it's interesting. Like I look back at that period, just of working at YouTube and it's fascinating to me. We had no ad agencies. We had no creative agencies. We didn't spend money on paid media. Um, we were totally scrappy. We had like a little bit of time from one UX designer internally, something like that, to kind of create this the channel that it lived on. Maybe Scott Free handled the key art, but I think we, we may have actually done that with their feedback and, you know, to create all of the you know, units, display units that we ran in the product, like it was all incredibly scrappy resource wise. Um, But yes, we definitely promoted it through the product through, you know, kind of display units within YouTube, through blog posts, we did a lot of blog posts at that point in time. Um, We reached out to film schools, created a bunch of collateral for them to share with students, we worked with some nonprofit organizations actually and distributed, I want to say it was flip cams back in the day. Um, yeah. To, yeah, remember those? To yes. the nonprofits. Um, because we also wanted to make sure that it wasn't just like a Western story of what life is like on Earth based on where YouTube had predominant viewership at that point in time. And so, you know, worked closely with nonprofits in countries where people weren't using YouTube quite as much at that time to make sure that those stories were a part of the film as well. Press, you know, worked really hard to get people to write about it. We, we would, actually, maybe I think we had Masthead on YouTube at the time. Actually, that was an ad unit that we did use. Um, so yeah, that was, that was it. But like, we did not know if, you know, if we would get like a hundred submissions. So we were, we were really blown away by the amount of footage that was submitted. What do you think motivated people to submit? It's a great question, you know? I mean, people have, like, busy lives, and it's interesting that so many people were intrigued by this. I mean, I think it was, like, early days of social media and streaming, and, like, people were just excited, I think, to be a part of something that was new and different and a part of the time. But if you did it today, would you get the same response or have people gotten used to social media as a part of their lives? And it's, it doesn't quite have that same special like, oh, what am I creating and what am I sort of yeah. pushing forward here? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to say. But I do think one of the things that I was most uniquely suited to see at Instagram was the breadth of what was happening. I don't know that it's mm-hmm. really easy for one person's experience as a regular user to see the width of YouTube, the way that one Uh person using Instagram can only kind of see their hallway of it. And these things are so big, of course, like even at headquarters, you don't fully understand them. But I felt like I could see so many different experiences and expressions of Instagram. And it was awe-inspiring all the way through of working there. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's the human condition. And I think YouTube and Instagram visually are two places that are really still sharing this perspective of what it's like to be a human being from the regular person's point of view in a way. It's It's just gathering that from all around the world. And as that experience changes, it changes. So I feel like to me, I mean, I need to go back and watch it, but It felt so poignant to me because it is really tapping into the human condition more than just this new technology. Like you guys just have a vantage point that is so compelling. But I was just thinking um, sort of that earlier concern about, you know, the footage might be of varying quality and how would that, you know, stitch together well. And, 
you know, watching it now, I almost feel like that's one of its strengths to uh, right. that seeing the different levels of quality actually makes it even more, you know, human, even more sort of accurate. And it's almost endearing to know that, yes, yeah, sure, some shots are a DSLR, you know, shooting 1080p and others are a flip cam elsewhere. And others it seems like someone's on a really old, you know, video cam yeah. um, and being yeah. reminded that the tools differ, but these experiences have common threads as well is beautiful. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I think had it all come in beautifully shot and high resolution, like it would not have nearly the impact that it has. And actually, yes, I totally agree that the variation in what came back quality wise just underscored the authenticity of the project and of different perspectives. And I think ended up being a real strength. And in a way, I mean, I think it just allows you to really focus on like the humanity of it. It becomes much more about, you know, the human beings who show up and what they say and what their world looks like. And, you know, I don't even remember being obsessed or noticing all that much, to be honest with you, the variation when watching it because that wasn't really the point. I also was so impressed with the way you released the film. I I worked in art before I worked at Instagram, which sounds kind of similar to working in film before working at YouTube. And I think what struck me so much about Instagram was it was egalitarian in a way that the art world was not. Similar, I think, maybe Mm -hmm. to YouTube. It, It had freedom. People could rise from, you know, nothing to having traction or having an audience for their work. And I feel like the beauty of the release approach that you guys had was it was also like very, I think, egalitarian in a way and incorporated the community into the release. And I'm talking about things like I believe everyone who submitted was named a co-director. You brought a certain number of people to Sundance with you who contributed and also the screenings were I think you could uh, submit your city to have a screening or to have the film come to your cities you could apply can you tell me about the way you approached releasing it and some of the things that you did and and why why did you do it that way why was that so obvious to you when it's not for other people releasing films I mean I think like there was absolutely no way that we were going to do a obviously a traditional theatrical release without a window on YouTube and and I think at the time too that was sort of a status quo in terms of Hollywood that we were dealing with day in and day out where you know there were just such fixed modes of how entertainment content gets distributed and what windows look like and it was not up for discussion and you know it's only I mean it's really very recently and post life in a day that that has started to change dramatically with so many streaming platforms so I think you know a traditional release was never on the table that said I think all of us wanted it to be seen on a big screen by anybody who wanted to see it that way and so it was kind of from the get-go, like how are we going to find a happy medium that allows us to showcase the film on a beautiful big screen, but also pushes up against status quo of how films get distributed and invites the world to participate in seeing the film just as much as we invited them to participate in making it. Actually, the first thing we did was we live streamed the premiere from Sundance, which had never been done before. You know, we had an ongoing relationship with Sundance. We really wanted the film to premiere there because it just felt like you know a great celebration and recognition of the work and how good it turned out and and like what great storytelling it was Um, but certainly we did not want to have a premiere at Sundance that felt elite and for only those who could attend so that was a great experience working with my now dear friend Katie Kennedy who ran um, partnership for Sundance at the time and uh, we really all had to like band together across YouTube and Sundance to figure out like how to get everybody on board with that because it had never been done before. It was unusual in some ways. I think it kind of challenged even the Sundance brand at the time. And, you know, we managed to pull it off. That was without question the most stressful day of my entire career ever. Um, we how had come? So met, oh, we had so many technical difficulties. And I remember we had, you know, I think I'm pretty sure we had Chad Hurley and Steve Chen in the audience, which is always stressful when your CEO, your founders are 
sitting there with you and I remember just all kinds of things that we, you know, because we're doing it all for the first time, like some sort of app engine quota that we, you know, had hit, like for the free tier, we had hit the quota. And so as people were trying to watch the stream, they were getting blocked because, you know, there wasn't enough like server space or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ad lib here because the technical side is not my expertise, um, which at some point we realized if we just, you know, put a credit card into App Engine and like increased our, our payment by, you know, $10 or something like that, we would be able to serve the film to many more hundreds of thousands of people. So anyway, um, figuring that out kind of on the go, we were really concerned about like buffering, obviously. I mean, just there were so many technical issues. And I remember just like being backstage in that theater and truly thinking that I was going to melt into nothing on the floor. But um, we ended up working for the most part. There were a couple glitches. There were a few moments of buffering, but we were experimenting with something new and it generally worked. And then, yes, we went broader. We partnered with National Geographic on the theatrical release. And then, as you said, did the, you know, request a screening. And, you know, with that, we would send out also like little marketing kits that people could use, flyers, posters, you know, to get their communities excited about seeing the film. And, you know, then it was obviously also available on YouTube for free. So, yeah, that was how that strategy came together. And all in all, uh, you know, one thing I wish I had done was something kind of like this with Instagram. Like, it's such a neat project. But if you were to talk to me, you know, say we went back like six years and I am a few years later than you sitting at Instagram with a very similar experience of all this insane user content all around the world and thinking about doing a project like what you did, you know, how would you make the argument to me about, you know, this makes sense to do in retrospect, like, does it make sense? And maybe not just if it's not just for business strategy, like I'm interested in hearing that point of view of what you feel like it did for YouTube, but also what did it do for morale or like user or employee emotional relationship to YouTube? Yeah, I guess the question to say it shorter is, is why do this? Yeah, I mean, I think I do think that this was a product of its time. I don't know that we would do it now. I don't know that we would be able to do it now. I think that was a really unique time at YouTube, both in terms of sort of externally how people perceived and were using the platform, but also internally in terms of kind of how small and scrappy we were and how much that enabled us to kind of just get done. And it, it is kind of mind boggling how much freedom there was. Honestly, I think I was like probably the oldest person working on that project and I was 29 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so like there really was no very senior oversight. They really like just, trusted us to go do it and that is how we got this done to be honest in many ways I think um, it wasn't like consensus driven stakeholder management it was just like go do the thing and make it great and we had, we did actually that's not true we had a great executive sponsor in London Anna Bateson who wasn't as you know didn't necessarily do the day-to-day -day, but kind of did help us when we needed to unblock and she's just amazing so anyhow um, I think that was a big piece of how it got done and that it was reflective of a point in time where an experiment like that really made sense. It's kind of like a time capsule of sorts. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you, last question. So you've been at Google slash YouTube for like 10 years or so, is that right? A right length It will time? be 12 in April, if you're counting. Wow. Uh, I, I'm wondering, you know, what keeps you at YouTube? Like why, why are you still there? What is it about? YouTube. So I actually, I left for a little bit. I left for four years and went over to Google. And then I came back to YouTube in December. You know, what I do now has like, there's undercurrents of what I did before, but it's a very different company and world. And, you know, that's really interesting too, for me to kind of process and reflect on sometimes. Um, but, you know, now I oversee marketing for YouTube Originals, which is our original programming effort, and some of our entertainment verticals, fashion and beauty, public figures. And I think now what's really compelling for me is just kind of being part of a business that is growing so many businesses at once. So, you know, there's YouTube Music and our subscription music service. There's YouTube TV. There's YouTube Originals. And then, you know, there's 
the YouTube kind of main app and experience and you know within that many many verticals so now it's like we're we're definitely not the same kind of scrappy company that we were in 2009 but you know we're growing businesses in a very different way and that is its own really fascinating experience so you know youtube is definitely a it, it evolves a lot um and i think i have nostalgia for the early days for sure but i also am like in awe of where the site has gotten to in terms of just how many creators are making their living on the platform, how many countries we're now in, how many daily active um, users we have. It's just like, it's the scale of it is super mind boggling. And so it just, it's a different experience now, but it's still very interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Kev? Anything else on your end? No, just thank you for your time. This is uh, it's so wonderful to hear some of the you know the background on the project and and what it's really like. I, I I'm stuck on the phrase Dragons Den. I want to have a internal program yeah, called right? Dragons Den. <laughs> I know. I don't think we have. We need to bring it back. I, I'm gonna work on that because <laughs> yeah. find it was really fun. Like called Dragons Den. <laughs> yeah, and like there was such great idea. You know, like just young marketers have amazing ideas about ways to like, you know, shake things up. So it was a really cool program. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much. It was real, really a treat. Thanks for giving us your time. And All right. Thank you both. Have a great day. (laughs) Thank you. See you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. All right, that's it for the episode with Sarah. What a rad woman. What a Thank rad you, Sarah. experience. <laughs> uh, Kev, you were there. What what sticks with you about our conversation with Sarah? I was there. You know, one thing that I'm thinking about is actually just the importance of um, Scott Free Productions, Ridley Scott, Kevin McDonald. Like if it was just YouTube HQ saying, hey, we want to do, you know, this Life in the Day video – compile all your clips, send them through. Like that would, that would be cool. But there was something really special about having, you know, a sort of a really world renowned creator or creators, these, you know, directors, editors, looking at all of the footage from these independent creators that maybe are seen as not as like professional, they're not part of the traditional biz and honoring that community with the perspective of sort of the, the more the, the well-known folks from the traditional side, I feel like actually it, it just feels like Sari did her job really well. Like if as a film community manager trying to change the perspective of the film industry on the community that was YouTube, what a great way to do so. Um, to kind of to mash up those worlds. Yeah, and like what a generous act to offer YouTube users mm-hmm. to be able to be a part yeah. of something like that. So it's like a win-win, even though that phrase is kind of a suspect phrase, win-win, just yeah. as an aside. Does it, it make sense? It should just win, be win. all winning. Yes, all winning. <laughs> Collective win. What, what about you, Bailey? Well, I think you can probably hear it in my voice in the interview. <laughs> I think my experience working at Instagram actually sounds pretty similar to, you know, both Sarah's experience working at YouTube, but also Mia, who we mentioned a few times, who's a friend of both of ours, who was the first community manager at YouTube. There's something very similar about the two platforms. They're creative, they're visual, they're global, and they have grown like insane, just incredible phenomenons. And I think when I look at what Sarah got to do with life in a day, and also some of the other things YouTube did, like the YouTube symphony, to me... I'm just jealous. Like those are truly like works of art. When you watch them, like Sarah said, you you feel like you learn something about the human condition. And I felt like that was almost like a little secret that we at headquarters for Instagram could see. But it was hard for other people to see it, to see so many different people posting all different things in their life from an American teaching English in Pyongyang to a Tibetan monk taking Instagram pictures in Nepal or in Tibet. But all of that just was really powerful for me for as someone who worked there. And what Sarah did was kind of take the experience of someone who works at YouTube every day and package it up and share it externally so people who are contributing can see what they're a part of. Yeah. So all that's to say is I think just like 
to me, this has been something that I looked up to for a really long time, and I'm just jealous. I wish I could go back in time and try to convince people on Instagram to let me do some kind yeah. of like epic project like this, but yeah. good on them for taking advantage of the opportunity to do it. Yeah, 100%. Cool. Cool. Well, that's it for this episode. Uh, if you want to check out... Life in a Day. Yeah, Life in a Day over at YouTube. Just just, just search it. Life in a Day. Exactly. You, YouTube Life in a Day to watch Life in a Day on YouTube. I think it's like 14 million views right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, if you want to find out more about us, Kevin, Bailey, People and Company, you can go to people-and.com, people-and.com. Um, and you can also say hi to us. Just send us an email, hi at people com. It's really fun to get emails from strangers, so yeah. we would really like it if you did that. But, you know, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. All right, see you next time. Bye. Bye.